Hello all my Kinvians and welcome to a new episode of Finally Coming Back, now that the latest series is complete. Discovering classic Doctor Who, uh, getting back into the first season of the show, and uh, completing it with the... Well, I, I will be going through the two final stories, which includes the Sensorites, and another one which I can't remember off the top of my head, but while it's not available on Amazon Prime, unfortunately, or the Brit box, as they call it, uh, I have ordered the DVD, and I think it... Well, it should have already arrived, so I'll be getting it soon. So, I'll be able to do the complete, or rather, complete the first season. But, today I'm going to be watching Strangers in Space and the Unwilling Warriors. So, just so you know, um, as usual, I have no idea whether or not how, uh, how much I will be reacting throughout all of this, so please do keep in mind, I may not be showing all of the episodes, or, uh, well, basically everything that I'm watching, especially if there are any long periods of where I just don't really react. So keep that in mind, but again, I will be having the extended release, the extended versions being uh, linked in the description down below. So, that's enough of me talking. Time to get into the show. Three, two, one, go! They're all dead. And that's a refrigerator. <laughs> Because there might be something that'll kill you. I learned not to meddle in other people's affairs years ago. Now, 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 don't be absurd. Star Trek. Just a model. Just said that earlier. Oh, hello. Is it weird that he kind of reminds me of David Tennant in the face? Really? Really? We've been over this a hundred He he may become violent. Unless they're marginally in his peripheral, then he can't see them. They're beans. They're little floating white beans. Which doesn't make sense, sense because space is a vacuum. Hi. You're ugly as sin. <laughs> Stop that. Okay. Right. So. Interesting. Interesting introduction. Without a doubt. So. One thing that really stands out to me. And I really do like the way they put this. Um, at the very beginning of the episode. They were talking about how. Like the travels has. The has? The travels have changed all of them. Like not just. Ian and uh, Barbara. I'm going to call her Jen for some reason. I don't know why. But um, but also Susan and the Doctor. And the Doctor puts it best. I feel like and this is the quote of the episode for sure. But it's been quite a great spirit of adventures. And I mean, it really has been. I mean, they've been on some very interesting adventures since uh, just the start of the show. It was admittedly a bit confusing when the Doctor brought up Henry VIII, because it, like the way he was saying it made it sound like that was one of the adventures they had also had up off of camera, seemingly, but 
apparently that was something that happened before. So I, I guess I just didn't fully understand why they introduced that part of it, just out of context. But, uh, obviously that brings us into their next big adventure, which is the, uh, the fight against the Censorites, I guess? Um, in the 28th century. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's rather intriguing, and I, I am, I mean, I've got five more episodes to go for this story, obviously, but I'm intrigued to find out why the Censorites are doing what they are. Is like keeping uh, the people that they capture with their uh, ability to take over people's minds, is like they don't kill them, they in fact somewhat take care of them. At least to the degree that um, they keep them alive, they bring them food, uh, they keep them supplied. They do put them into long-term sleep, which is more of a pacification technique, obviously, and showing uh, dominance over the Earthlings and possibly others that they might have captured. But, yeah, it's... For the most part, it doesn't seem overly aggressive, except for what they have apparently done to John, which it seems like... I don't know, hopefully they'll explain a little bit more of what happened to him, but it, it was almost like just pure madness. Like, they got into his mind and... It's like he clearly still retains memories, but he didn't really seem to have any memory of maybe what was going on when he was being controlled by the Censorites. Just memories of what came before and wanting to protect them. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. Again, I'm intrigued to see what's going to be happening next. And what... I do have a few issues, and I know this is just, a lot of this has to do with um, just the style of the show and, you know, the way things worked back then and having to work with budgets, but the whole, um, the way the lock rays work doesn't really make sense to me. It's... Like, okay, yeah, it's like, you know, you wave your hand in front of the eye, which breaks the ray, which causes something to happen. But it's like, it was closed from the outside, so we can't get out through this door. <laughs> like, even that alone, it just, as far as, like, security protocol on a ship doesn't make any sense. It would make more sense that if you lock it from the inside of that main, I assume what's the cockpit, that no one from the outside could get in. And, I mean, obviously it's just, you know, for the plot and all that, but it does bother me just a bit because it just feels illogical overall. And then also, well, as far as how a way that could work is if just, you know, someone messed with the security protocols instead of just waving the hand, which seemed to be kind of the, it's how you open and close the doors there. But another thing that I thought about while, while watching was the cutter that, um, oh, what was his name? Uh, John, no, not John, Maitland. The cutter that Maitland was using, I'm curious to know what that was exactly as they were using it on the set, because it was, it did seem to actually be doing some cuts into the wall, which I'm sure is just sort of a, a very precise special effect that they were working with. And so I'm, like, if anyone knows, uh, please let me know. I'm, I'm curious as to how they made that work? Like, did they just sort of give off the uh, appearance that it was actually making these cuts? Or was it actually being used for something? I, I'm just, I'm a little bit confused by that, but very intrigued. 
because that's one of the special effects, you know, whatever they may be using, that it truly does stand out to me. But uh, beyond that, um, when that high-pitched whine started happening, uh, what would make sense to me is if it was interference perhaps coming in over the instruments that they use on the ship that's coming from the uh, the sensorites ships or whatever it is that they use to uh, travel through space but especially considering back then the show was still primarily aimed toward like the educational aspect of the show it just seems really strange to me that there's noises coming from the outside, like out in space, where space is a vacuum. You there there you don't hear any noises. So I assume that maybe that's how it'll be explained if they actually do explain it as one. Maybe uh, like it was interference over the instruments or two. And this would explain why they're all hearing it, but it's sort of the sound as sensorites are coming within range to be able to start taking over the mind. Now, the sound doesn't necessarily mean that they've taken over a person's mind, but it's essentially like the sensorites attuning to your mind's frequency and like their attempt to try and grab hold. I don't know. I I hope that's the direction they go, uh, whether or not they will. Who knows? But, as we saw there at the end, there was a very ugly-looking alien, and uh, I can only assume that we'll get to see one very shortly uh, inside the ship. That reminds me, though. That does remind me. Um... It looked like, and I could just be remembering incorrectly, but when the lock or the locking mechanism from the TARDIS was taken, which I'm ignoring the, you know, strange logic behind how that works, but um, uh, it looked like a human hand that reached out and used the whatever. I, I could just be mistaken, but it looked like a human hand, so that made me think that maybe it was John that had uh, taken the lock somehow, like maybe under the sensorite's control. But unless they're able to sort of like teleport on and off of the ship, um, that makes me think that there is already a sensorite on board. And if so, where are they hiding? Although, again, I'm just curious to get into the next episode and see what's going on. So, uh, let's go ahead and get into The Unwilling Warriors. And uh, fair to assume that maybe The Unwilling Warriors include Ian and maybe the one guy whose name I keep forgetting, Maitland? Possibly John, if he's filling up to it? Only one way to find out. Three, two, one, go! Hi, Ugly! The Unwilling Warriors. It hurts, Precious! Somebody's offering him to do something. Hello. They are my friends. They're terrible friends! Nanu Nanu. If you don't return my property, we must decide what we shall do. 
There's four more episodes, so I'm guessing they don't. I don't know. Okay then. Well, it's I'm intrigued by the story here and I'm interested in finding out more. But again, it's it's part of me trying to get used to um the old style of things, how they, like, the, the pacing of the stories. Again. <laughs> but yeah, um, so Strangers in, no oh wait, Strangers in Space, what we watched before, The Unwilling Warriors. I mean, it seems like the name's a bit inaccurate, <laughs> just in my opinion. But yeah, um, not much was learned here other than the fact that they actually came into contact with the Sensorites, other than, you know, one of them just being outside, which indicates that they are able to, well, they don't need to breathe in order to survive, or they don't need oxygen, because it didn't look like it was in any sort of suit, unless you count the suits that the Sensorites were actually wearing, or the actors played the Sensorites, obviously. But yeah, um... Well, I guess there were a few things that came out of this episode. Um, the, the concept of the mi mind resistance, when uh, Barbara and Susan basically sent their thoughts out to counteract that of the Sensorites, and I thought it was kind of funny when the Sensorites just kind of fell over. But, I mean, that's a concept that, as far as sci-fi is concerned, it's... Oh, I don't know if I would say it's common, but it is something that has been utilized in different mediums before. And I do like that they... The way Susan explained learning about it... Um, where uh, when her and the doctor were on a different planet, uh, when they stand stood between two plants on that planet, it's like there would be sort of this loud screeching sound, kind of kind of like the plants screaming because they were sensing another mind between them or another mind interrupting them. So yeah, just the uh, just that concept of being able to resist with their mind and sort of protecting John as well as themselves uh, by fighting back when it wasn't expected, or the, yeah, the Sensorites didn't expect it, was really quite smart, in my opinion. And it, it makes a lot of sense as far as, again, uh, sci-fi tropes go. Now, the, the first Elder thing, I'm guessing probably meet this first Elder... Uh, in the next episode, but it just, I don't know, there, there's certain aspects of it that even though, I know it's like they had a certain way of portraying things and a lot of it is sort of like a, a play essentially, I, I don't know, I part of me kind of wishes that we hadn't actually heard the first Elder's voice. That it was basically just one of the Sensorites uh, relaying what was being said. Or if not that, just have both of them listening and then have the First Elder's voice be playing uh, while they're doing that. I didn't really see the point in like one of them listening while the other stands guard or whatever, they just kind of stand there. <laughs> it's not exactly like the other one would not be able to see. Or maybe they wouldn't. Maybe that's one of the things, like when they hook up telepathically, it's like they're focused on that. I don't know. Just kind of trying to think through the logic of all this. Now one thing, I, I mentioned this during the reaction, but one thing that really stands out to me, it's this phrase that Ian says 
uh, like it's a saying we have on Earth, or maybe it's an older saying from the UK specifically. But uh, rich beyond the dreams of avarice. I've never heard that before. I've heard rich beyond your wildest dreams, which. I can only assume is an offshoot of that saying, if it in fact was a saying at some point. But yeah, just rich beyond the dreams of avarice. I've never heard that phrase before at all. So again, it, I, I admit it may have been a phrase at some point, it's just not one that I am personally familiar with. If it is, or at least was, a saying at some point, and you know of it, please let me know. I'm uh, that's another thing I'm legitimately curious about. It's just, personally, I don't know. It, it seems like even in some older media that I've watched, it's like Rich Beyond Their Wildest Dreams has kind of always been the way of putting it. So I don't know. I don't know. Again, I'm curious to hear what you all have to say. And then the biggest thing that we learned from this episode is that the uh, the censorites intend to have or they they want all of them to go down to the planet or the sense sphere and have them stay there forever so they're a seemingly peaceful culture or at least they prefer nonviolence. otherwise I don't know why they would have done what they've done so far but then there at the end it's like Susan's convinced that if she didn't go with them down to the planet that uh, the censorites would kill everyone on board and uh, that's where I uh, like I sort of question is like you know are they actually just a peace loving race that feel like they've been wronged by humans before which is understandable that they would hold that prejudice and it's and they're bluffing like they wouldn't actually kill them it was just it was a bluff essentially or is it one of those things where the previous humans uh, pushed the censorites to a certain degree and not wanting that to happen again, uh, could the resistance of the Doctor, Ian, Barbara, and uh, the others here, like, would that be enough to actually drive them to being violent, to actually killing? Because that doesn't seem to be their M.O., at least so far potentially psychologically torturing someone because they found out about that mineral that I can't remember and I didn't write down. I mean, that, that's one thing. I wonder if, like, whatever happened to John, if that's sort of a misunderstanding. It's like, you know, they did try to pacify him, not necessarily torture him. But it does seem that, at least mentally, he has been tortured. Whether or not that was intentional by the Censorites, I hope that's revealed. Or maybe I'm just being kind of naive and that's the implication there. I'm really curious to see what happens in the upcoming episodes and uh, yeah, finding out more about this story. It's not the most action-packed one, but again, this is... After the latest series of Doctor Who and watching stuff like Steven Universe and all that, I'm having to re-readjust myself to uh, the classic era and uh, just, just the pacing with which they take their stories. It, it shouldn't take me too long, and I do apologize if you know me poking fun offends anyone. It's all in good fun. Like I definitely appreciate what they're doing here, but it's it's part of my nature too. If I see something that makes me laugh, or if it makes me think of something that can make me laugh. I, I want to say it, I want to share it, and hopefully other people find the humor in that as well. If not, I truly do apologize, but that's just the way that I 
enjoy watching these shows. Like, not just this, but other shows as well. Like, I will poke fun if something makes me laugh, whether it's something classic, something new, what have you. So yeah, just wanted to put that out there. But, everyone, thank you for being here for this episode of Discovering Classic Doctor Who. Oh, and by the way, the shirt I'm wearing right now was sent to me by my friend Kyle. Merry, wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey Christmas. It's a very cool shirt. I unfortunately didn't get it until after uh, the holidays, but I wanted to wear it in this episode at the very least. And honestly, it's quite comfortable, so I might be uh, wearing it every now and then too for the Doctor Who videos, because hey, now I've got another Doctor Who shirt that I can wear instead of the two that I have. Actually, I might only have one. I think one of my shirts went missing, unfortunately. But regardless, uh, as I was saying, first of all, thank you, Kyle, for the shirt. I loved it, if you happen to be watching one of these. And also, I'm looking forward to hearing what you all have to say about these episodes, as well as your thoughts about what I've had to say. Uh, you know, looking forward to getting back into this, back into Classic Who. I'm going to do my best to make these fairly regular Especially since I'm one caught up with Steven Universe and, you know, don't have to worry about any uh, new Doctor Who for quite a while. Uh, in addition to this, I don't know what other shows I'm going to be doing, but, uh, yeah. I'm going to be doing a lot of stuff in general. Some different shows as well as some video games. So, I'm rambling on again as always. So, until next time everyone, for Hidden Danger and A Race Against Death. I'm Papa Ken, and I will see you in the next episode. Until then, allons-y!